this topic is about getting started online and it sounds like <laughs> in your business you have a really lovely sense of community and the website that you want to start is one that really brings the community together with a lot of different elements. Does that sound accurate to you? Yep, awesome. Incidentally, if your Zoom slows down a little bit, that video yeah, in the background exactly might right. be the exactly. cause of it. Yep. So, so what you could do instead is I just put a blank be... background. It's um okay. So is that under view? It will be under the little carrot on video settings where it says choose. Uh, can you see the little stop video oh, button? Yeah, There's a little back. up arrow. Yeah. Yep. Choose background, and if you change it to none or blur, that will be a bit a bit better. That's better. Yeah, then, yep. then you don't have your background exposed as well. The only thing is if you move your hands, you'll get nice webbed fingers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see all the community. The, the busyness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, but someone has to do it, so it's all good. <laughs> so the kind of website that you're looking for with um, lots of different elements, so we talked already um, before this recording started, for anyone listening to the recording, we talked about it having a centre point for local community events, possibly something that you might branch out and do some online sales with, and also information about just what's happening, what's available, services, those kinds of things. So you've got a lot of different moving parts there. One of the first things you need to get started is a domain name. So irrespective of what website you have, you'll need a domain name. In Australia, most people run with a .com.au. So there's so many places you can register these. The price range is somewhere between 20 bucks to 120 bucks. The difference between those prices is generally connected to how much service you get. So domain oh. names are a little bit like a commodity, like you can really buy them from anywhere. But sometimes you might want to do something with that domain name and the cheaper providers, they provide mostly online service, not so much phone support. The more expensive providers will walk through with you and do a lot for you. So that's the difference between them. Have you thought about maybe what your domain name might be or have you bought one already? Uh, no, I haven't bought one, but I was thinking of Bolin and Co. Bolin and Co. All right. Well, what I might do is I might share my screen and we'll have a little search for that and we can have a a look at how all that works. So hold on just a second. So I'll share my screen. And so where I'm going to go is the Australian Registrar for this is called AUDA. They're like the primary organization in Australia that controls the what we call the Australian domain space. And so we're going to try looking it up here. Yeah. So Bolin and Co. Is that right? Did I get that spelling right? So um, B O L O N. Oh yeah, my spelling's awful. Let's try that. It's okay. Emoji. It's beautiful. And co. Yeah, and then we have to put this funny text in here. Whistlers. So where it says not found, that means woohoo, it's available. <laughs> yeah. So it's available for registration. The only thing I would say about domain names is. They are not case sensitive. So you can have them all in uppercase or a mix or all in lowercase and still always lands at the same place. So when you are promoting this, I would consider... Because I was thinking, those I was thinking for the and. Oh, okay. So you see how the words are so much clearer once you do that? And incidentally, email addresses also yep. are not case sensitive. So you can do that in the email address as well. So you were thinking with the end, what were you thinking there? Can you do the character? Unfortunately, no, you can't do characters in domain names. Um, and I would also avoid doing just okay. the N because number one, you get a double N, but also you'll be forever explaining it. That's N, just the letter N. Yes, there's two Ns. <laughs> so Bolin and Co, that looks, that looks okay. Um, yeah, I think that's good. Is the domain name Bolin available at all? Don't know. It is. I would consider that. Oh, it is a place a name. Simple. Really simple, yeah. It would be the primary domain for that area. Like in our case, I live in Cairns. Mm -hmm. And the primary domain for our area, cairns.com.au, is owned by the newspaper. 
And in a sense, oh, that's geez. kind of what you're doing is you're creating a bit of an online newspaper in a way. So, yeah, that's I would correct. consider this one. Yeah. Especially, it's very unusual we find a place name that's available, by the way. So it is um quite quite lucky in that sense. What I'm going to do is just down in the chat, I'm going to put that link in there for you so that you can uh, see that and click on that and bring it up just in case you want to try some other ideas for domain names. Now, that's the first thing you need is a domain name. The second thing you need is a website. And when it comes to websites, there's lots of different options and lots of different platforms to choose from. They all have positives and negatives, all of them. So I'll try to run through them and we'll see if we can pick a good one for you. One thing that I should say is that if you were to go to a web developer, so somebody who specializes in making websites or sometimes a web designer, then they would usually look after buying the domain name for you, arranging a service that's called web hosting, and also building the website on your desired platform. Every web developer generally specializes in one or two platforms, usually one and sometimes a second one. Some of the platforms, so earlier you mentioned Wix, that's an example of a website platform. And it's got a couple of competitors, probably its closest competitor would be Weebly and Squarespace. And all three of those, so Wix, Weebly and Squarespace, they all include both a website builder and web hosting as a single package. So web hosting is kind of an invisible service with those platforms, but that's essentially what you're mostly paying for. And web hosting, it's kind of confusing, but how you should think of it is like the landlord for your website. So you mentioned you've got a shop front, so you probably mm. pay rent to a landlord there. And that's exactly what web hosting is, is you are renting some space on a very fast server, on a very fast internet connection in a secure building where only really nerdy people go. And they're, they're very loud, they're, they're locked down and they're fire resistant and all sorts of things. So um, you're basically a web host is a digital landlord. So that's how you should think of it. That you have some physical files on a hard drive on a computer somewhere in Australia and so in the case of Rich Weebly and Squarespace, they act as both your web host and your web builder. The biggest, most popular platform on the internet right now is called WordPress. So WordPress is a bit of software that WordPress. builds your website for you. And all of these bits of software have some fundamental things inbuilt and can all expand the website with other features through plugins, integrations, or applications. They all have much the same name for exactly the same thing. So in the same way that you might download an app for your phone, you can also download an app for your website to make it do something different. So generally, the, all of these software come out of the box with some features already, and then you expand them thereafter. Probably um, the one I would choose for you, which I am a little biased because I am a web developer, that's what I do for a living, is um, I would probably go down the WordPress avenue. And the reason I like it the most out of those four is that it offers a very large number of expansions. There's a plugin for just about anything you can dream up, but the base software also has quite a lot of functionality and flexibility to all sorts of environments. So as an example, something that you mentioned before is you wanted to have events on there. And I've run a few websites with events on them before. And I'll tell you, the first thing that will happen is you will get sick of reading someone's email and figuring out all of the nuts and bolts of that event and putting it onto your website. So transposing it, copying and pasting it out of an email. And so a great little expansion for you would be to have a public add an event button where they can type it all in for you. and it's when somebody does that, you get an email to go in and approve it. So then people can't put naughty events up on your website. You have to approve it before it goes live. But the most important thing is that you're not spending your life copying and pasting other people's data and promoting their event probably for free. So, um, yeah, that's a good little expansion that I've used in the past. 
And I think that you'll find something like that useful. You probably want an events calendar where people can search it, see multiple things on it each day. And that's definitely an application that you would expand the original software. In the world of WordPress, we call them plugins. And the plugin that I've used before, it's really neat. It's called the event calendar. <laughs> so if you're wondering which one it was that I used that has the public add an event, it's that one. So I think that's you. oh, my pleasure. I think that's probably the one I would choose for you. Um, if you don't have a web developer, getting started on WordPress is a bit more tricky. If you're booked into this program, so I'm not sure if you've come into a word into the workshop through just Eventbrite or if you're actually registered with the Digital Solutions program. Do you know? Yeah, I yes, I registered with Digital Solutions. So yes, I am in the program. Oh, cool. So that means you've got three hours of one-on-one -on -one time with an advisor. Have you booked anyone yet? No. Oh, well, if you would like to, this is something we could do together, is I could set up the bones of WordPress for you on a production server and then train you in how to do it. And then you go away and do all the things. And then we come back together at a later stage and launch that live. So um, not only that is we could test the other platforms as well and see if you're more comfortable with those. So sign up for a Wix site and have a little look at that. Sign up for Weebly and have a look at that. I would say Squarespace is the least likely one you would choose out of all of these just because it doesn't have nearly as many expansions as the other one and something you mentioned earlier about the possibility of selling that off is mm -hmm. Weebly was acquired by Square recently so in your um, Australia Post shop you might sell the little Square readers the, um, mm, I yeah, do. That, yeah so those Square readers are actually um, they have now bought a whole web development platform and they've integrated e-commerce into that very tightly, and that's Weebly. So they're transitioning the name over to Square Up. So what used to be called Weebly will now be called Square Up going forward. But um, yeah, it integrates really well with the whole Square environment, and it's quick and easy to add products on and sell products through that. It's the easiest platform of everything to sell stuff in terms of quick and easy. So if that was your primary aim and not so much the events, and the community stuff, I'd drive you towards that one instead. But because you want it to be more multifunction, I think WordPress is probably the right tool for the job. So yeah, that's all the different, okay. um, all of the different ones. So what are the drawbacks with each of them? Well, they're all a little bit different. I would say that in terms of ease of use, I think Wix is probably the easiest if you are very low tech in your skill base. I think the one that has the prettiest kind of templates is Squarespace. So if you wanted to have the kind of site that was very kind of visually beautiful and minimalistic and definitely in that in Instagram kind of influencer space, then Squarespace would be the one to look at. Uh, and Weebly is great for quick and easy e-commerce integration. In all cases of those three, they can't be moved and they have limited customization but I think they're good if you're very low budget and don't have much time. So that's what their pros and cons are. Um, with WordPress there, I think the major advantage is there are more people in the world that can code for WordPress than any other platform. So it's the most ubiquitous. Uh, WordPress says they run about half the internet right now, which I think is probably quite accurate. And there's lots and lots of different kinds of templates that you can use for it to make the design look very good. Um, the reason why I think it's great is because it can be expanded so easily with lots of functionality. So yeah, that, that's the overall arching things of all the different platforms. Um, do, you, do you have anything else that you need it to do? So we've talked about events, general information, a bit of e-commerce. Did you have anything else in mind? Do you, do you want to try your hand at a bit of blogging maybe? Yeah, or... I do. And I want to create like a historical space with our, with our elderly community. So we have a heritage centre and I would love to integrate their stories because a lot of people love, you know, have such a good connection with our town and they've moved away but they still have family, although we still have, you know, a handful of oldies still here. And I just love to get their stories on how it was and, you know, and 
yeah, just don't know. Keep keep that going. Um, yeah. Even going up through the levels, not so much, you know, it doesn't have to be the older generation, but it could be, you know, the ones that were in school, they might be 50 or 60 now. And yeah, so yes, yeah, so I would love to do sort of that that style of, of um, you know, have that sort of info on it too. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I would definitely run down the WordPress Avenue then because there are some good inbuilt tools that help make that a little bit easier. But you might actually want to try your hand at video as well to capture some of those stories and pop it up onto a YouTube and you can just yeah. do a process called embedding. It's very quick to insert a video into a WordPress website or actually any website, it's quite quick. But yeah, it's a nice way of storytelling and remembering some of those times. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly quicker than have, writing um, too. We have one of our elders in town. Yeah, oh, it would be. So one of our elders, that's what I'd love to do is sort of get, you know, that Indigenous side uh, the stories from our town as well. Um, our oldest elder, she's nearly 97 and it would be lovely, nearly her whole family still live here in town. It'd be lovely just to capture that generational culture as well. Yeah, that, that sounds oh, great, embedding, okay. That's fantastic. And I also see one of our business station people, Sarah, has joined us. So a quick shout out. Hi, Sarah. I know we can't see you, but a quick hello. <laughs> Thanks for dropping in and saying hello. <laughs> So now we've talked about the platforms. Let's talk about what you need to get together to get the website started. Now, really, you could start without any of these things together, but it does make it a little bit easier. So first thing is you should have a think about having a logo. So even if you were going to just go with the name Bolin, but still call it Bolin & Co, that would be okay. But you need to think of some kind of logo, maybe you might want to take it super seriously and get a graphic designer to design something for you. But at a very minimum, you need to think about what fonts might I use and what color scheme might I use. So even if you don't go down the professional graphic designer avenue, there's no reason why you can't just choose a nice font and choose some colors and get started that way. I will say something about fonts is the fonts that we have on our computer are different to the fonts that we can use online. So fonts have a licensing model that's a bit like how photos are. So when you take a photo, straight away the copyright of that photo is yours. And if I was to design a font, the copyright of that font is mine. And so if you find a font on your computer that you like, chances are you won't be able to get a web license for free. You have to buy a web license to actually use that font on your website. And so what most people do is they have a look at um, some Google fonts. So Google has gone to font designers and specifically licensed them so that we can use them for free. And I'm just going to share my screen and show you them. So hold on a quick sec. How I find these is I just type in Google fonts and then it lands on here. And then we type something and we might say Bolin. And let's say we want to go with Bolin and Co. Let's start there. And we can see all the fonts very quickly. We're probably not going to choose this Japanese one. Maybe for a logo, we might want it to be sort of a bit fancy. So we'll get display fonts. We'll make them a little bit bigger so we can quickly evaluate them. And straight away, there's some good ones and some bad ones. We've got a lot of options. And if you, I might just make that a little bit smaller so we can see Bolin. So do you get a bit of a feel for the kind of font you might want to use? This one with these little tails, we call those tails serifs. So that's a serif font. And without them, that's a sans serif font. So yeah, total going back to Latin class here. And so let's say you wanted to capture that old world kind of feel a bit. You might just use serifs and we just have a look at those. And see these look like they're a little older style. They're more like mm -hmm. what we tend to see in a newspaper. Some of them are quite nice. Like that one's got a really lovely looking fancy ampersand. Is Bolin... Yeah, I quite like that one. Yeah, that one's a good one, actually. Play fair display. That one's quite a nice one. And any of these fonts, if you like the look of them, you click on them and you can see more detail, like what all the different options are with italics and weights and bolds and things. And also, if we go all the way down the bottom here, it will give us popular pairings. So this is using this font as a heading. And then this second font, Roboto, is as the body font. And so you can check it against other fonts and see if you like it. So usually when you're choosing a font, you would have one font for headings and another font for everyday body text. 
And ideally okay. the body text is really easy to read. And the heading font can be a bit more fancy because it's a lot larger. So even if it's a bit more tricky to read, it's okay because it's big. Mm -hmm. So these ones you can have a look through and see what you like and what you don't like. If we swap them over, you can see that this font, Wayfair is not that great as a body font. It's a little more challenging to read that. And so I would definitely keep it for headings, but probably not for everyday reading. Yeah. So that's your first little homework list, Victoria, is to go to Google Fonts and have a little look to see what you like and what you don't like. And if you decide to go down the route of having a full graphic designed logo, then um, you can show them and say, these are the kinds of fonts I like. I'm just going to pop that in the chat below as well. So you can click on that and have a little peek. Now, the next thing you need is to decide on a color scheme. And mostly a professional color scheme is one or two key colors and then a bunch of neutral colors. And by neutrals, I mean white, black, and everything in between that. So uh, the 100,000 shades of gray. Sometimes what we see as neutrals is you might have a signature color. So let's say we go with maybe yellow, for example. One of your neutrals might be a very pale faded out yellow or a, a slightly gray version of that color as well. And that makes a nice little color scheme. If we think of, um, do you have a color in mind incidentally? Is, is Boland famous for a color? Is there a landscape probably, color scheme? Probably red, probably red oh, or, or, or orange. orange. There you orange. Go. There we go. Yeah. Orange more than anything, I think, Nikki. Like the, you know, like that um, that dusty, ready sort of color. Um, and the green's not a lush green. It's more of a, I don't know, like a gray green to go with it. But yep. yeah, maybe like that. Na yeah, maybe the the navy and the the the, the orange. I think that's quite. All right. Yeah, so anyways. let me show you a tool that I use for color generation. It's called coolers it's like colors spelt the u.s way with an extra o in it and let me show you how i use this so you click generate up the top and then it gives us some color schemes and so we can actually do a bit of a search so let me just show you quickly some cool things is if i press space the whole thing changes and if we decide that there's one we like which i haven't really found anything in the there we go there's an orange if there's one we like, we can lock it and keep it there and just change the others and see what comes up against it. Or if we want to start to get well, yeah, a little bit um, a little bit more persnickety, so we said maybe a green, review shades here, maybe we make it a little bit more intense and look at them side by side and go, you know what, that orange probably isn't quite right. Those are a bit closer. So that's how you use it, is you play around with the different color schemas. You can um, copy them or duplicate them, drag them all around. We can get rid of some so there's not as many. So it's quite a good little tool to play with different colors. They also have this explore tab up here where we can go and look at other color schemes that other people have chosen. Oh, look at that one. That one's actually similar to what we had in mind, actually some good gray spaces and some good orange spaces, but let's say we want to search for just orange. I actually like the one next to it, Nikki, the one with that oh. dark blue and the aqua. Let's have a little peek. I'll just take that back. Hold on. I hope it's still there, this one. That one's a good yeah, one, actually. That, yeah, I quite like that. Oops, it wants me to try to save it. We want to view the palette. Yep. Yeah, that one's Is really that lovely. Too too many colors though like should you know does it just mm. get how many is too many that's a really good question yeah um, so if we were to take this color palette it's quite a nice color palette in that the colors are quite muted any one of these colors you could pair back to quite a light color and it would still match really well with the rest so in terms of color palettes this one's a very good one if we if we have a think about websites or uh, maybe companies that have a lot of colors in their color palette news.com.au is the first one that comes to mind with me with this really crazy looking round logo with lots of colors and how they implement them is important so in this case they've got this colored line at the top they've got their logo but by and large the website is black and white 
And that's the same mm. for most websites. The colors are used really selectively. And in this case, most of their colors are coming from their photo with the occasional little red spot here. So they've got a live spot there. They've got this breaking news panel at the top. And if we go into the individual articles, there's actually not a great use of color. There's a little bit here for the navigation and Jack Painters somehow, he's um, in blue, but mostly this is a black and white website. And so depending on what kind of media you will have to use, maybe that's your approach as well, is this could be your color scheme, but you're using the colors very selectively and in tight little spots. If we think of someone else who has a really bright color scheme, uh, let's think, maybe Virgin. If you think of Virgin, what colors come to mind? Just white and red. White and red, yeah, and the red's super intense. So let's just have a little look at their website. Is they have introduced a purple into their branding suite, but not into the logo itself. And so they use really bright, intense colors as key parts of how you get around the website. Mm -hmm. And I think for most websites, they wouldn't be able to pull that off. That's really intense color scheme work here. Whereas if you get down into the nitty gritty, so if we maybe try to go into, let's try travel information and have a look at, oh yeah, carry on baggage. Tell us about your rules for that. Oh, they're still using a fair bit of purple. It's still fairly neutral, but the purple is quite prominent. Okay. Yeah, it's not too bad, actually. This color implementation is okay. They probably had a very large budget to do it. Can you think of another website, another company with a bright color scheme? Who have you got down your neck of the woods? I suppose the Aussie Post have white and red, don't they? Yeah. So if we have a look at how they implement theirs. Oh, there we go. So we've got a bit more judicious use of color here. They're using their red for action points, wherever they want you to click on something, learn more, track. They're using their red really well. Here's a background neutral color here. Remember I mentioned shades of gray? That's a nice little way of bringing focus to this top panel. And then as we come down, it's more white. So yeah, this one's a pretty well implemented color scheme while the red's still quite intense. So using it for attention. So absolutely no reason why you can't have a lot of colors in your color palette. I think the thing is though, you probably wouldn't use them as primary colors. You'd use them for attention. Does that make sense? And what I'm going to do is that color palette you liked, I'm going to put that in the chat below. So you can click on that and open it up and come back to it later. And um, that color palette then is available to you for you to be able to use. When you put your mouse over those colors, it gives you that color in all the different kinds of color schemes there are. There's a web color scheme called hex. And then if you want to use that on a logo, it'll have a different color scheme again. So yeah, they all work. And if you want to get it painted, it's really hard. They're all, there's no centralized standard for all of the different ways colors are represented. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that in the print world, they use CMYK, which is like cyan, yellow, magenta, and magenta. black, I think. Yeah. yeah, the offline world is a little foreign to me, so I find them really confusing, the way colors work. What are the online ones? They use hex codes. They perfectly logical to me. So I'm not going to Bunnings to go, I want Torbman's in that colour, please. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. They work in <laughs> tint, tint ways. <laughs> and so once you've got those two sorted, pretty much you're, you're on your way. You've got a logo, you can get some business cards printed, you've got a colour scheme. If you did want to print product labels or um, maybe do some flyers of some sort, that, that's your base to start working with. The next thing most websites need is some media. So media being photos or videos. For most people, it's photos first. And how photos work from a copyright perspective is once you take a photo, you own the copyright, it's completely yours. You don't have to register it in any way. It's instantaneously yours. Um, so that means any photo that you see on the internet that belongs to someone else. And you can't just do a Google search and grab the images down and use them. Often those images will be owned by a professional photographer 
and sometimes they'll send you a nasty letter and maybe an invoice for using those. There's some really big stock libraries on the website where you can purchase photos at a low cost. And so I'm gonna go through them in a second. But the important part is sometimes when you see a photo on Google, it's actually owned by the stock photo library. And um, I had a client up here who bought a new business and they got a nasty letter in the mail from them with a bill for 55,000. Because they had the old web developer before our time had used 10 photos that were just taken off Google. And um, that stock library said they were 5,500 per photo. So it was, um, yeah, you can get some really nasty letters from taking photos off the internet. So let me show you how to do that so that doesn't ever happen to you. So first thing is I would probably, if you have the capacity to, go around town and take some photos. Or if somebody is giving you information about an event that they're running, that you ask them for photos. But just you do have to be careful with this bit because if someone sends you a photo that they have stolen off the internet, it's still your fault because it's on your website. So if anyone ever gives you a photo, you need some kind of disclaimer or to ask them to say, just checking this is your photo or you have permission from the photographer to use it. Just to make sure that you're indemnified from that because public community kind of websites, they can run into that sort of trouble. So make sure they've got permission or you've got permission to use the photos. So first thing when it comes to online photos, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna run through a couple of them together is uh -huh. this one, Unsplash. Why I love Unsplash is because number one, the photos are free. And so how this works is if you are a photographer, you can upload your photos to Unsplash and give permission to everyone to use them for free at any time. And so let's say there was an event, um, maybe there's um, a teddy bears picnic, going to happen in the park. These top ones, they're ads. So if we scroll past the ads, then all of these are available for you to be able to use. Some are cute, some are a bit boring, some are amateur, some are quite good. And so you could pick one out, that one might be suitable, and you just click this arrow, and then that downloads the photo down onto your computer. You can optionally put on your website that Jerry Rang was the photographer and say, hey, Jerry, thanks so much, and link to this page of all of his photos, but you don't have to. The scope here is very good, but what I will say is when it comes to locations, it's not that great. So if I search for Cairns, for instance, we're a tourist place, just so you would think that there would be a lot of photos for us. They're okay. There's some. So some of these are quite professional, but there's none of the city mostly of the Great Barrier Reef and what's around. So in our case, there's a little bit to choose from. In your case, how do I spell it again? B-O-L-L-O-N, yeah, O-N, got it. O-N, yep. And so, oh, look, we got a sad face, boo. <laughs> 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 and chances are that's gonna happen the same everywhere. So if you think of maybe the landscape, you might be able to buy, get some specific things related to the landscape or generic things that are objects, but actual location, that's gonna be quite tricky. So this is the first one. I usually turn here first because this is the free center. So if I want to, um, if I'm doing some work on a PowerPoint and I want to include some information about Google Maps, I always search for something like that Google Maps and there's enough results there for me to be kept busy. They're not super pro, but they're definitely okay. The next one I turn to is called Adobe Stock. And this is owned by the people who do Photoshop. Works in a similar way that photographers upload their photos to here. However, in this case, there is a small fee for using them, but you can get 10 for free if you sign up for a new account. You're not obligated to pay for an account thereafter. It's a genuine 10 free. Um, I'm going to guess we're probably not going to find any of them here either. Oh, is that you? Is that what it looks like? Let's see. Hmm. Doesn't uh, actually have an exact location. The Queensland yes, town of Wallen on Wallen. Oh, hmm. well, look at that. If I click see more, this photographer has a bunch. 
in that same space. So you may very well be able to, oh, he's got a Cairns one in there too. Very good. He's been off photographing lots of places. So you, you might be able to get a couple out of here. Um, at least you could grab a couple of freebies. And in this case, an aerial photo isn't the easiest photo to get anyway. So that photo may very well be something you want to keep in your arsenal anyhow. The cost after the 10 free is around about five Australian dollars each thereafter. So that's the, my next favorite one. If we search, um, if we go back to my teddy bear search that we did before, we'll probably get slightly higher quality photos than we did previously. So yeah, they look a little more polished. Sometimes I think that polished look isn't what I'm looking for. I want things a bit more gritty and realistic like this one, but that one certainly has its place. It's quite cute. <laughs> So um, yeah, <laughs> that's the next level up. And then the pro ones, when I really want great photos is I turn to iStock, photo iStock photo. I always Google everything, by the way, I'm not really a bookmarker. And we're gonna try bowling again and see if you're more popular in iStock. Oh, so this is the name of an actual product. Oh no, I don't want roll on, I want roll on. There we go. Same photographer by the looks of it. Yeah, so the same photographers uploaded in two spaces. In iStock, he gets a bit more money for them. So definitely check both of them. And now we're into the super professional looking stuff. Very finished, big white backgrounds. People have spent mm. time chopping them out of those backgrounds. So these are around $20 Australian. So there's a bit to choose from out there. I will say... There's nothing like the trust of having your own photos because people can kind of sniff stock photography now. We have an eye for that genericness that comes with stock photography. So it is ultimately better if you choose your own photos or if you can get them from the community in some way. Up here, our tourism um, bureau, they run uh, little competitions from time to time. So might have, um, we're looking for photos of Clownfish, does anyone have any in their collection? And um, you win some kind of prize if, if you let them use your clownfish photo. So maybe there might be some future opportunities in that for you as well. I don't know if that's a possibility, but it's definitely worth a try. It's cheaper than hiring a photographer, that's for sure. So we can work on that. Yeah. Usually what you do when you design a website is your homepage is a very splashy page that is the overarching center point of everything. So its job is to really introduce the business, to look credible, but also to grab someone's hand and pull them into some other part of the website they find interesting. So it's usually quite long and has lots of different moving parts. In your case, it's probably gonna have a bit about upcoming events, a little bit about community stuff, a little bit about purchasing. So there's a lot of different pieces to the homepage. Mm -hmm. But often at the top, there's a really lovely signature image. And so that's where you want your best photo is front and center at the top of the header. For websites that are maybe a bit more swish or often tourism focused, I'm just going to show you one that uses video as the header. I will say that um, when we are loading this across Zoom, it might hang a bit. It loads much faster if I'm just looking at the website. So this is Skyrail, which is a fairly large tourism facility up here in Cairns where you get in these little gondolas and go through the rainforest. I've wanted to do that ever since I moved to Queensland. Oh, really? I only did it for the first time last year and it was really good. Mm. It was, you know, as a local, we don't do our own tourist stuff and I was so surprised with how amazing it was. Yeah, I really loved it. You can oh, get off at a couple does, of stops. Yeah, oh, you're lucky. <laughs> and you know what I didn't know is part of Avatar was filmed on Skyrail. You know that James Cameron film? Yeah. I had no idea it was an alien landscape as well, which is really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, this, um, this is what we call homepage video. You'll see that this is cycling through only four scenes and they're very short. So they're one to two seconds each. And I don't know what the compression looks like through Zoom, but the video is highly compressed. So it's not super 4K amazing resolution. It's designed to give you an impression to put you in the moment. And so this is a possibility for you as well is just to take a couple of snippets, 
keep it super simple in terms of the scenery, but also I think it makes a beautiful visual difference. Um, I'll show you another one. There's um, this is a company that I think in terms of companies, you know, this one is pretty dull. It's a, a real estate that specialises in rent rentals. And so in terms of video content, you wouldn't think it's that interesting, but you know what? They've got their staff is in uniform. They've got a nice premises. They show you what it looks like from the outset. They look like they're quite professional. They set up signs. So this video actually gives you a great impression of their credibility, even though the business itself, you wouldn't think it's that photogenic to be able to take videos of them. They look super friendly. So yeah, I think um, video is definitely a good option if you want to engage people for just a little bit longer. And the video doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. You could just take some video on your phone and that would be good enough when you're displaying a big, big video. You probably didn't notice then, but none of those videos play sound. And that's because often when people are on their computer, they're doing naughty things, like they're looking at Skyrail, dreaming of their Christmas break when they should be at work. <laughs> And so deliberately, those auto-playing videos are not playing any sound so that they don't deter people who are in a workplace and they don't go, well, what's that playing over there? Is that a nice tropical beach? If I can hear waves in the background. You don't want any of that stuff. You want it to be silent videos for auto-play. But yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea on what you need to collect to get started. Because ultimately, as soon as you've got the bones to your website, you're like, oh, well, what am I going to put in there? And this gives you a chance to collect some things and start start putting some things in there and making it look like a real functional um, situational site straight up. Now, with our last 10 minutes, a couple of things that I want to cover is I usually tell people to go and do a little bit of homework and have a look out there and see websites that they like and websites that they dislike. And usually you'll like or dislike a little snippet of it and you want to try and keep a copy of that somewhere. So maybe make a Word document and do a screenshot and paste the screenshot into Word and just maybe put a circle around it and say, oh, I like the way the navigation works. It's really clear for this one. Um, that pop-up that just came up and offered me $10 off, I hate that. I don't want a pop-up. Most people hate pop-ups, but there are a lot of them out there on the internet. So yeah, have a, now that you're starting to get into the, the rhythm of what's my website going to have on it, you'll probably look at other people's websites a bit differently and start taking note of the things that you like. Um, particularly, you might want to have a look at other community-driven websites around Australia. Usually when you look overseas, culturally, websites are a bit different. So when you look at American websites, they tend to be very busy and Aussies find them a bit overwhelming and rightly so. Probably the closest side-by-side -side country to us would be the UK in terms of how their design tends to work. Um, Scandinavia tends to be minimalist, even in their design style. But yeah, USA websites are a bit overwhelming. Certainly go and have a look and see if you can think of some destinations you've either been to or want to visit and go see what kind of community sites they've got out there and do a bit of a comparison. And then you're seeing like by like, who, how do they display their events and what kind of community information do you find useful and what could you leave? Maybe have a look okay. at a couple of other museums as well to see how they display that history stuff, how they mm. categorise it and whether or not they just do it in a blogging sense, so it's sort of like latest news, or if they actually keep it and document it and categorise it well. Many museums will have the incentive of trying to get you in rather than putting it all online. So you will probably have to dig deep to find something that's got a good directory of that kind of history info. So that's really um, another little piece of your homework is as you're surfing the internet, have a think about, oh, do I like this or do I hate this? And the last thing you need for a good website is you need some text. You need to write about stuff. And coincidentally, this is what Google likes as well. So usually when we launch a brand new website, the first thing people say is, Nikki, how come that's not up on Google yet? Well, Google is amazing, but not quite that amazing. It takes sometimes a few days, sometimes a few weeks for a brand new website to get into Google. But once Google finds it, how it ranks you is based on the things that you write about. 
So if you want to rank for keywords related to your location, you're gonna to have to write about the location. And ideally you'll have a little bit of that information on the homepage, but you'll dig deep into info on particular subjects. So if you wanted to rank for history of Bolin, then you need a page about the history of Bolin. That's the best way you should think of it is whatever you want to rank for, you need to write about. And so capturing the stories from others is great because that's them doing your writing for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about ads? Like if I want, if I have, um, you know, to, to keep that, that site viable um, as an option later on, if the Shire wants to put, you know, their tourism ads on there or if um, there could be a company from like one of the businesses that would might want to put an ad on there or invite, like, so how, do, how would ads work in that way, but not overwhelming everyone, just, you know, even if it's just the icon of a sponsor or something, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, let's have a look at a couple and I'll show you how online the ads work to an extent. Um, hold on just a sec, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna have a look at News Limited again. So this is the center point of the online Murdoch network. And it is kind of overwhelming from an advertising perspective. This bit up here, that's an ad. And down on the right hand side, this is also an ad. Both of these ads have been provided by Google. And so you could do the same thing is you say to Google, you can have this ad space here and Google will read the text on the page and automatically load an ad in for you. That program is called Google AdSense. It doesn't cost you anything to do. You just um, copy and paste a little bit of code and then Google will do the heavy lifting for you. And that's exactly what these two are. Now in News Limited's case, they use this a lot. And so if we go into an individual article, you see the ads are different again in here, but a little bit less intrusive. Well, other than this massive one at the top, well, actually they're pretty intense. And they're gonna auto play me some video. Let's go back for a sec. Uh, oh, a ceiling collapse, great. What kind of ad will we have against that? Let's see. The summer of fun. <laughs> So yeah, it, they've actually changed this a little bit recently. See how this is that is chasing me down the page? It's staying still. Yeah, they are. Uh, so, mm. I, uh, I find so, that quite overwhelming. It is really overwhelming. You don't have to have it quite that solid, uh, but, but this is the extreme example, definitely. But these ads, there's lots of different shapes that you can put, and you can put them in here over on the side. The one that was down lower is probably the less intrusive shape, that square one. And all of those come from this Google AdSense. If we ever look at another one, this is a smaller publication and it's an independent publication. They source their own ads. And so these square ones down the right hand side here, they're ones that they've arranged individually with those companies. So a couple of hotels and the council. And these are just a little image or in this case, they have a little bit of animation and Newsport directly has an advertising relationship with those companies and they put them down here. Still, I think it's a bit intense. Like there is a lot of advertising going on here, but I guess that's how they make it viable is they really do have a lot of ads. The other option is if you have a look at sections like perhaps... Let's have a look at jobs and notices. This is probably a good example of one. These ads, the jobs themselves, the companies have paid to put on this website. So I don't know how much they've paid. It's probably a couple hundred dollars. And so then the latest, oh, there it is. It's a hundred dollars per position for a 14 day listing. <laughs> so they actually, <laughs> this one might be a good one for you to look at. So this is a, um, little newspaper from Port Douglas. So it's about an hour north of here. It's a small community, um, but this is their only representation in terms of uh, a community newspaper. And so that they would get the lion's share of any kind of advertising for them. And it's nice that they actually put their pricing front and center there. I'm guessing real estate would probably be the same that they would pay to have these listings in here as well. 
real estate are usually good advertisers because they need to promote those those products, but also new the whole realestate.com.au really does dominate that market. So, you, you know, depending on the local market, you may or you may not have good success in that arena. These kinds of ads down here, we refer to those as run-of-site ads because they appear on multiple pages, whereas in the jobs notice, they're quite neat. You have to go here to see that ad. So this style of advertising, uh, like a directory kind of advertising, is probably less intrusive and a bit nicer to use. So you might charge someone a certain amount to list their event, or maybe if it's a free event or a community event, you don't charge them at all. But maybe if a, I don't know, the Chamber of Commerce is putting on a networking event that they're actually making money out of, then they're one you might want to advertise for a small fee. Another kind of advertising I've seen used a lot is um, some of these smaller publications, they send out an email newsletter and they'll have advertising spaces in those emails as well. And I actually think that could be quite good for you because on the website you could get have a sign-up, so sign up to receive our weekly news and that's a genuine thing that members of the community would like to read and it's a good spot for an ad. Yeah, yeah especially if you idea. get a lot of the community in there, not only the community but also you know, government stakeholders who have they come to the region to do things from time to time, they would also get on that newsletter. And so you'll probably collect easily a thousand names to, to promote to, and it's a captive audience. So that's another spot yep. for some good ads. So that's really all of the things that you need to get started online. So think of a good domain name. We found a couple for you today. Both of them are okay to use. I think the important thing is because you're an Australian business and your uh, customers are going to be Australian, you want a .com.au ideally. If the .com was also available, I usually like to buy those just for the protection because you don't need a business to have one of those. So anyone can register one. So I like to have it if it's available, but it's certainly not essential. You do need a web hosting account, but if you go with Wix or Weebly or Squarespace, it comes with those. If you go with a WordPress site, you need a web hosting account when you launch. The costing is about the same for both. So it doesn't matter which one you have, both are gonna be the same. I want you to start collecting some photos so you've got some media to work with and start to write some things about the region, the town, how things work around there, the history, all of those things that we can start building into that website. And then finally, have a little look around to see what you love, and what you don't like so much, so you know the mistakes you don't want to make and how you would like it to look. And that's really how you get started. So what I'm going to do is, we've just reached our time, so I'm going to stop our recording. So bye-bye everyone who's watching the recording. <laughs>